Before we get started, let's talk about Pushkin Plus. Pushkin Plus is a subscription podcast program available on Apple Podcasts. Members will get access to exclusive bonus content, like my weekly bookmarks, where I talk about how I got a book agent and what I'm watching on TV that week. You'll get uninterrupted listening to many of your favorite podcasts, like Revisionist History, Cautionary Tales, and The Happiness Lab. Sign up for Pushkin Plus on the show page in Apple Podcasts or at pushkin.fm. To use the skills and, and my energy and time, that's what allows me to get up every morning. I look at the life that my mother had and that her mother had, and realize how much more that I have. And so to honor her, I I just feel that you're on the earth for a short time and that you have to use that time in the service of, of others. Anita Hill's career has been in the service of others. She has spent her whole life defending and supporting women that society has overlooked. Miss Hill taught a generation of women like myself that speaking your truth is never easy, but it will give you a sense of peace. When I started the Well-Read Black Girl Book Club, I saw women like Anita Hill as inspirations, in part because she drew from her own life experiences, but also because she knows how important community is to every single movement. We can't do it alone. Service can seem daunting. Like, where do I start? How do I start? But thanks to visionaries like Anita Hill, she makes it all feel within reach. She gives us a beginning. And with her latest book, Believing, she gives us a roadmap. Welcome to Well-Read Black Girl, the literary kickback you didn't even know you needed. I'm your host, Glory Adam. Every week, I'll be talking to writers, thinkers, and makers about how they found their voice, honed their craft, navigated publishing, and yeah, showed up in the world. In this episode, I talk with Anita Hill about her career of service. Who inspires her? and how this current cultural moment can lead to real change. Today's episode is really special to me because I'll be in conversation with another host in the Pushkin family, Anita Hill. Since 1991, Anita Hill has become a symbol. She embraced her role as an advocate for women's rights and gender equality, especially for Black women. She's a lawyer and an educator, and she spent the last 30 years working on her new book, Believing. And I get to chat with her about that process and why that book is so important right now. Professor Hill is determined to use her platform and her own experiences to help the most vulnerable victims of gender-based violence. In this episode, we'll be talking about believing women when they are brave enough to come forward and speak their truth. By the way, Glory, I was going to wear my (laughs) T-shirt. So I, I can't Amazing. remember where I got it, but I did get the Black Girl Reads t-shirt yes, that I was going to wear it. You. Um, but, you know, how things are when you get dressed, you got to get ready. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. I'm, 
I'm so, so excited to meet you again and, and have you on the podcast. And congratulations on your amazing book. Oh. This is, I have it all highlighted here. It's so phenomenal. Thank you. Why did you decide to write this book now? And what were you hoping your audience and readers would take away from it? Oh, uh, well, first of all, I, I, I had been working on the ideas for the book and the things that were brought out in the pandemic, the inequalities and inequities and the vulnerabilities, uh, including that more people were vulnerable to violence because they were in their homes. Mm -hmm. All of those things kind of came together and I knew that I had to write the book. I knew that gender-based violence was one of those things that we desperately needed to address. And I, what I wanted people to take away was this sense of urgency for addressing the problem, that mm -hmm. it wasn't uh, a problem that just was going to go away on its own. It wasn't going to go away because a new generation would come along and resolve it. It wasn't a problem that was going to go away because of some minor fixes. The problem was much more complex and deserved complex solutions. Third thing that I wanted people to understand is that it is a larger problem than one behavior or a few bad apples out there that we read about. It's really an everyday problem as well as an astonishing series of egregious problems. And so I wanted people to understand that it was real and part of their lives or part of the lives of people who they know and they care about. As I was reading it, it hit me that Every chapter, it feels like a lifetime of material. It feels just like I'm reading your history and your testimony. And not only am I processing all of that, but I also see just like the light that you have for your community and for the next generation, you know, and like thinking about who you were in 1991 and then coming full circle and seeing everything that's happened. What does that feel like? Well... First of all, it's it's feels probably pretty odd because as I explained in the book, I'm I tend to think of myself as a very private person. And so with that, you know, really just reflecting on my own life on me um is something that I have a hard time really doing. But I did want to understand for people to feel that um in in getting their stories and telling them that I was sharing some of myself too, that people have been so generous in sharing their feelings that it was just important for me to share some of my own sense of who I am and, and to help them to understand that what I had experienced, while it's never the same as what other people experience, was very real in my life and, and that I really understood the consequences. And I had been walking in the steps of, of people who had been abused uh, by individuals or systems in one way or the other. And I was trying to be as generous as people were to me uh, in my own way and still maintaining my own sense of authenticity of who I am. It's hard though. <laughs> It is challenging, but you definitely feel your generosity on the page. That is one thing that really shines through. And it made me also think of your first book, Speaking Truth to Power. Um, what was the process from that book in 1997 to this? Was there a big difference in your writing process? Yeah, well, you know, I call it a 30-year journey because there are things that I have come to understand in the past 30 years that I, I, I wanted to add to this book. Um, the process to me was not only about telling about me without letting my ego be too much a part of the story, but it was also about how do you integrate in the stories of other people whose experiences are very different from your own into a narrative? Um, and how do you address the skepticism that some people have because, oh, they want data. So that you want to put the data in the book, but you don't want the stories to get lost. You don't want the feelings, the emotion, the harm, the 
the pain and, and in some cases the joy to be lost. You know, it's funny, as a lawyer, we have to tell stories. Mm-hmm. We tell stories about our clients' cases uh, in the courtroom. We tell stories when we're teaching. We use hypotheticals sometimes, and sometimes they're real stories. And we learn very early on as lawyers that how we tell the story really can impact what people take away from it. In your book, you referenced your mentor, Judge Hickenbotham, who once said to you, I never talk about race without talking about gender equality. And Black women in general, we tend to receive so much criticism when we try to tell our stories. How do you stay the course, not losing sight of talking about gender equality and race in your work? Right. Yes, well, it's it's so intuitive to me because you know I identify, of course, both with my gender and with my race. And in 1991, it was very difficult uh, after the Commons hearings because I I felt as though I were being excommunicated from the black community, and that was very hurtful. So part of the reason I uh, wanted to write this chapter in particular was because I, I wanted to again, put light on some of the limitations that we have, even coming forward to talk about what happens to us, how many limits are placed on on our ability to talk about our experiences. And that was the point of view I was coming from. It's like, what can I say that will make it easier for people to step up and to be present and to be open about the pain that they've experienced. To look at the problem of violence uh, of any type simply through one lens means that we're going to lose people, that Mm -hmm. we are not going to hear people. And then so then the question is, how can we as a community be open to hearing all of those perspectives? Uh, How do we get rid of this idea that when Black women tell about their experience, it's harmful to the community? And how can we get us to the point of acknowledging that, in fact, our community cannot be strong if over 50 percent of the community can be targeted and abused because of how they identify Uh, in terms of their gender and because they are women or because they are trans. So uh, those were the things that I was thinking about. And and I don't think that I have all of the answers, but what I wanted people to take away is that it is in the entire African-American community's best interest for us to be able to tell about our pain, because that's the only way that we are going to get to solutions. I agree 100% when it comes to this level of vulnerability and being open to to share the difficulties. I've experienced it in my own life, not being able to tell my full story and feeling that restriction. And when you can tell your story, it's such a liberating feeling, but it's not only you, it's like the people you encounter, it's your family, it's your friends, it's your larger community. It actually shows them that it's possible. And I feel like that is the one thing your book, Believing, does. It just gives us another level of possibility and, and it presents the questions to us so we can talk amongst ourselves. I, I want to talk to you about your experience with the Me Too movement. And when you first encountered those words, Me Too, and you learned about Tarana Burke, you write about it in the book. But what struck you about it? Were you excited and exhilarated? Did you think like, it's about time, <laughs> you know, that these things are being acknowledged? What was your first reaction to the Me Too movement? Well, I think I was just astonished because it happened so quickly. And, you know, it was global. And um, I didn't know about Toronto Burke's work beforehand, uh, but I do recognize that it was work by Toronto and many others um, that allowed that Me Too movement to happen, um, to, for it to become a social media movement, whereas with her, it was her personal movement in trying to help young 
black and brown girls heal. So first of all, I thought, you know, this is amazing because we see how the seed gets planted, but we don't necessarily know when it's going to grow and really become bigger and and involve so many people. And so I was very excited about the fact that it was happening. But the other part of me says that I think the media in presenting it initially presented it as the experience of white women. Mm -hmm. In fact, it took off in part because many of the women involved were Harvey Weinstein victims and they were Hollywood stars. And so that became the face in some instances. And so I knew that we still had a lot of work to do to expand, to be inclusive, and to understand that what was happening to BIPOC women, poor working women, low-income women, was just as important and, and should have just as much air as and attention as what was happening to the women in Hollywood. I know you oversee the Hollywood Commission. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Well, the Hollywood Commission came about because a woman named Kathleen Kennedy, who is a producer, she's the head of Lucas Films, made an announcement after the Me Too movement surfaced that Hollywood needed some kind of commission that would build the standards for treatment of the abuse that was made evident by Me Too. Mm -hmm. So she and Nina Shaw, who uh, is an attorney in uh, Hollywood, and then and Rita Caper Klein invited me to, to join as the chair of this commission. We didn't know exactly how we were going to do this work, but we knew that we had to bring in people from all different sectors in the Hollywood community, because this was not just an individual problem, or it wasn't even just a behavioral problem. It was an industry-wide problem that had historical roots and that had been built into the structures, the way people were hired and the way people got top billing and so we knew that we needed just about every segment of the industry is, or is, as much as we could get them represented on the commission. And it's long been my theory that if you can provide equity, if you can provide safety and protections for the most vulnerable, then the rest of the populations are going to be taken care of. Yes. And so one of the things that we have done is to do a survey of Hollywood workers to know and learn who are the most vulnerable. There is a lot of work going on. And I think it is that kind of work that will ultimately change the behavior and the culture and the structures that cause people to, to be harassed and discriminated against. I'm Glory Adam, and this is Well-Read Black Girl. Today, I'm speaking with Professor Anita Hill about her recent book, Believing. I, I want to get back into believing because everything that you're saying is about like resources and like execution and ways to, to really take these ideas and theories and put them into practice. And I want to talk about the practice of writing for you. Was there a particular chapter or was there a moment as you were writing this that you felt a breakthrough or what moments really made you feel proud of this work? Well, one of the places where I did it uh, initially was in the chapter about what's happening in our schools to children. When I read it at the end, I said to myself, if we read no other chapter, please read this. If people are saying, you know, where do we start? And they have to pick one place. Let's start with children because they are the most vulnerable and they're so vulnerable to the pain and the harassment and the taunting 
and, and just the sheer brutality, the physical brutality, as well as the emotional and psychological, based on who they are. That's where we, I think, begin to see the most damaging behavior, where it can continue lifelong. And so if you had to pick one and Mm -hmm. you had to do away with all of the others, um, that would be it because that's where the urgency is. And so I guess that was the chapter I looked at and said, this is why the book was worth writing. I love that. And I know we share a common love for Polly Murray. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think she is so iconic. And I I want more folks to know about her work and her poetry um, and just her life. Her life is just so outstanding. And there was a poem that uh, you had referenced, uh, Hope is a Song in a Weary Throat, that I wanted to just read two lines of of the last stanza. Give me a song of hope and love in a brown girl's heart to hear it. Can you tell us how she inspired you? And if there are any other writers like her that give you inspiration or hope or just a creative surge? Yeah, I mean, she was so bold about her ideas and her intelligence. She never tried to hide how smart she was. Um, and, and, And she was bold about making sure that she put their intelligence to good use um, in terms of the things she cared about, which was racial equality and gender equality. Um, But she was also very bold about who she was at a time when we really weren't having conversations about people being trans. The, the, The idea that she had thought very carefully about uh, her identity and was certain that she was born in the wrong body and was certain that she w- was going to do whatever she could to to change that, to correct that, and, and you know, tried um, to get medical attention to help her do so. Um, but I think it was, it was, because she was just so certain about what she had to offer the world. Uh, and she wanted to be able to do it as her authentic self. And I take that away from her story because it's just so impressive if you think of all of the challenges that she faced and faced and, and the way she just went after them. I mean, she, she challenged A. Philip Randolph uh, who was like the dean of the civil rights movement before there was a Martin Luther King? Um, there was mm-hmm. A. Philip Randolph, right. and she I challenged went to Howard. I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she challenged his sexism. Yes. At a time when you know, in the March on Washington, he had excluded women from speaking roles. There are um, so many more. Toni Morrison. When I wrote Believing. As I was putting together the proposal, and she died, and I was on an airplane, and I saw a, a documentary about her, and it was so clarifying in terms of who she was. And the real takeaway from that was intentionality. I knew I could never match her voice <laughs> in terms of her writing, but I, I did try to channel her spirit in terms of really honing my own voice to polishing it so that I could be clear in writing, believing. So those are two people, two writers that really influenced me for different reasons. Again, there's there's just so much beautiful information in this book. What was your research process like? How did you like curate and put the book together? Well, I had a, a general outline of every chapter, but, you know, as a teacher, we're always researching. So I had stories that I plugged in, the outlines, I had research that I plugged in. But I was constantly to the end, always trying to verify and confirm and refine the points that I wanted to make with my own thinking, but with the thinking of others. Uh, And so the process was really iterative. 
when did I finish writing the book? I finished the writing the book when I put the last period on the sentence. I was I didn't finish one chapter. I mean, I was always going back to chapters to make sure that I had it right and to make sure that the chapters fit together. I didn't write a chapter and then put that away. Uh, I was constantly going back to them and reconciling things. But I'm also, I have to say, I'm, I was a completely messy writer. And so I had brought on someone who helped me edit my mess, <laughs> clean up my mess. And that was that was definitely a part of what allowed me to get the book completed. But the research, uh, there was some research that I had help with that in in the past, but when it came down to writing it, I, I did most of the research. And, and there is a lot in there because the thing that I wanted to be intentional about was I didn't want anybody to walk away and say, oh, you know, she's just talking about herself. There's no evidence. These are just her ideas. There's no evidence. There's no logic. And I wanted it to all come together. And even though I know there'll be criticisms, it was just important that I have all of it. Maybe that's my, the lawyer in me. But I wanted to make the case as strongly as I could. Yes. I, I, I love the titles of your books, you know, Speaking Truth to Power, Believing. They just leave such a, like a strong impact on the reader. And you can't forget those titles. In the past, you've said the title Believing comes from your inherent belief that we deserve better. Our families, our colleagues, our institutions deserve better. What is better? Can you tell us what better looks like for you and for our communities? Well, better is for us to to develop a response to the violence that so many people are experiencing that attempts to prevent it. Right now, what we have is a system that says, okay, here's how we will respond if you can get through the gauntlet of reporting. We can change our culture and our thinking, I believe, to eliminate this problem from happening. Prevention should be our goal, not waiting until people are harmed to say, let's think about what the solution will be to their harm. Mm -hmm. Better would be for there to be a national commitment to that prevention, where we actually have a a president that says that this is a public issue that I want to commit my presidency to doesn't mean that you have to exclude everything else. But this to me is an issue that deserves the thinking at the national level. If you think about all the ways that our institutions are implicated, whether our colleges and universities or our workforces or our military, even our Congress and the Supreme Court, all have been implicated in gender violence issues in ways that cause people to have less confidence in our systems. I think that's a public crisis. And then finally, better would be engaging survivors and victims in solutions, really engaging them. Then beyond having them come and tell about their pain, really trusting them and asking them, how do we solve this? So believing for me was believing that this was the right issue to take on and that I had a special place in addressing it. Thank you so much. This conversation is just so fortifying. And I know everyone listening will feel just the the love and generosity that you've offered us um, and the tools you've also offered us. You're also just so calm. I love, like, you're just so so calm and collective. Maybe it's a lawyer in you (laughs) as well. Uh, Do you have, like, a guiding principle that you live by or, like, something that just gives you, like, a mantra or something? I would love to hear a Professor Hill (laughs) mantra. Because I just feel like you just wake up, uh, like, assured every day. Like, you just have this energy. (laughs) Well, you know, I, I... You know, I come from this family of 13 children growing up on a farm um, in Oklahoma. In, and in, 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 when, I'm not, when I'm talking farm, I'm not talking about farm. I, I wake up thinking, what a privilege I have to be able to 
be alive and to be able to talk about and to use the skills and, and my energy and time, that's what allows me to get up every morning. Um, and, it, and it comes from a lot of different sources. And some of it comes from the fact that I look at the life that my mother had and that her mother had and realize how much more that I have. And so to honor her, and I, I just feel that you're on the earth for a short time and that you have to use that time in the service of, of others. Um, and and use what has been given to you. And that comes not only from my parents, but it comes from my siblings and all of the hope and the faith that they have in uh, me. And that's that keeps me going. Hello, I'm Anita Hill. Thank you for listening to Well-Read Black Girl. So we're going to do what we like to call rapid fire. Oh, gosh. I'm so bad with (laughs) rapid fire, but I'm going to try. They're they're fun. They're fun. First one is name three items on your desk. A light. A light. For uh, video conferencing, <laughs> always there is a pad and pencil because I don't like I don't like to type everything. I like to write things out. It's part of my process, and typically a big bottle of water. <laughs> Stay hydrated. We like that one. Yes. Favorite comic book character? I don't have a favorite character, but let me tell you, I was a big fan of Stan Lee. You know, oh. oh yeah, and I and one of my wishes was that Stan Lee would make a comic book character out of me. Oh my <laughs> goodness! Okay, so this goes to the next question: It's if you were a superhero, what would your superpower be? Oh, I have thought about that, and that <laughs> is. We have superheroes where they can, like, look into the future. Um, My superpower would be every time that I met someone, that I would be able to glimpse their past. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, because I think if we know their past, you understand how they behave and why. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, I might have to borrow that superpower because... You know, I encounter some people. <laughs> it's like, what? Um, <laughs> and then, no then you find out in the, about them and you're like, oh, now I get it. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> actually a really good too one. too late. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a really good one. Um, okay, this is going to take you back to Oklahoma. I want to know about little Anita. What was your favorite game to play at the county fair? Oh, well, I always got, you know, hooked on those little things where you, you the crank where you're trying to pick up something. And that I always felt like this should be, you should be able to do this mechanically. Uh, and I never could. I never <laughs> was. So, but that was my favorite thing to try to grab that toy uh, with the cr- crank in the, in, yeah, the, the inside the box. Yeah, thing. with yeah. the box. And it never worked. <laughs> but it was kind of fun to always try. <laughs> So the last one. So I, I'm curious to hear about your childhood nickname. The only person that ever did use a nickname was my father. Like I said, I was the youngest of 13. And and he was perhaps the only person that I think of who ever called, who called me baby girl. Oh, that's so sweet. That's sweet. That's sweet. That's the only nickname you need. <laughs> yeah, that was the only thing I needed. <laughs> Wait, Anita, before you go, you have a podcast of your own coming out soon, right? Yes. Well, I have a podcast coming. And um, and I and I know you have your podcast and, and uh, you are of a generation where, you know, that's so familiar to you. For me, I feel a little bit like a dinosaur. No. And I'm trying to channel I'm trying to channel people like you, young people 
uh, to to really get the, the knack of it. But I have a wonderful team. They're they're working hard on me. You are doing absolutely <laughs> wonderful. You are, listen. I just like I just told you your voice is so calming. I think that's like ninety nine percent of it. Like get, having a good voice when you're sh- you know sharing the stories or listening or interviewing people. Your voice is very calming. It's like very soothing. I know when I listen to podcasts. Oh good. That's what, that's what I'm looking for. Like I like like the richness of someone's voice. I don't know how my voice is going to sound. Oh. But, oh, oh it's you. great. It's great. It's just like I think some people were made for it. But um, so that's very exciting for me. I'm going to continue to do um, the work with the Hollywood Commission you've talked about. I continue to teach. And and um, I'm very proud, if I must say so myself, of the book Believing. And I just want to thank you and and all of your readers. We are proud too. We in and it's, it's so it's so wonderful. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I literally there's so many highlights in this book. I wish I could like show you. It's just it's like it's <laughs> in terms of being a memoir and a resource and just a history. It's like living history. And and I want to tell you that I, I don't take any of that for granted. I, I do feel like I said I'm quite privileged to be where I am today because I know that there were so many people that would never have thought that I would be even known. And in fact, I had one journalist say, oh, you know, in six months, nobody will remember your name. They were wrong. They were wrong. So. Thank you. Thank you. Speaking your truth, especially as a victim of gender-based violence, isn't easy. It's even harder for Black women if the person being accused is a Black man. About one in three women experience sexual or physical violence in their lifetime. We need to keep talking to one another, the Black community, and to be open to having these tough conversations in order to be stronger together. Thanks to Anita Hill, we are a step closer. Speaking with Anita Hill, I'm reminded of what a big impact she had on my own life as a young person. Seeing her on TV, speaking to the entire country, becoming a heroine for so many. Like Professor Hill said, these issues are larger than just her one story. Taking them on is about all of us. Read Believing, our 30-year journey to end gender violence. It's out now. Well Read Black Girl is a production of Pushkin Industries. It is written and hosted by me, Glory Edom, and produced by Cher Vincent and Brittany Brown. Our associate editor is Keisha Williams. Our engineer is Amanda K. Wang. And our showrunner is Sasha Mathias. Special thanks this week to Vicki Merrick. Our executive producers are Mia Lobel and Lee Tall Molad. At Pushkin, thanks to Heather Fain, Carly Migliori, Jason Gambrell, Julia Barton, Jen Guerra, John Schnars, and Jacob Weisberg. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at WellReadBlackGirl. You can find Pushkin on all social media platforms at Pushkin Pods. And you can sign up for our newsletter at pushkin.fm. If you love this show and others from Pushkin Industries, consider subscribing to Pushkin Plus. Pushkin Plus is a podcast subscription that offers bonus content and uninterrupted listening for $4.99 a month. Look for Pushkin Plus on Apple Podcast subscriptions. And if you're already a subscriber, make sure to check out my exclusive bookmark series on Pushkin Plus starting on February 18th. You'll hear extended interviews with book club members, bookstore owners, and more. And you get to hear what's on my mind, what's on my radar. And of course, what's on my reading list each week. To find more Pushkin podcasts, listen on iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you like to listen. 